fixed inflation. Uh, you can see the outline of my talk here. First, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the basics of Higgs inflation needed in order for you know, my talk to be self-consistent and for you to be able to follow the main part, which is uh, the self-consistency uh, from, the, from the effective theory point of view. Uh, then I'm gonna briefly comment on different formulations of gravity and uh, particularly about uh, the Palatine incarnation of gravity and what happens there and what changes and what does not change. And then I'm gonna conclude. So uh, what is the starting point? Uh, the starting point of Higgs inflation is to take uh, standard model uh, scalar sector. That is the Higgs field. Usually, okay, conventionally in the unitary gauge, I denoted it with H here and uh, allowed for inter allow, uh, allow to interact uh, directly with the gravitational scalar curvature R via a non-minimal coupling of uh, this form, psi h squared. Here, the notation is pretty self-explanatory. Let me note that phenomenology requires psi to be a, a large uh, number, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. And uh, the usual uh, Higgs potential at uh, energies relevant for inflation uh, it's, uh, it asymptotes to its quartic form, h to the four. Now, uh, the way to understand intuitively why this must work and why it gives successful inflation is to realize that m, this parameter here, uh, is a small explicit breaking of uh, scale symmetry at field values relevant for inflation. Or to put in other, word, in other words, uh, this, uh, this model uh, is uh, exponentially close to the sitter, and this will become clear in the following. So the way to see that explicitly is to do a field definition by, uh, and, and make gravity canonical, that is to, to acquire its standard Einstein-Hilbert form by moving to the so-called Einstein frame via Miller scaling. And, uh, once we do that, we realize that uh, there is nothing, for, nothing comes for free. This seemingly innocent non-minimal coupling of the scalar curve, actually this polynomial uh, interaction of the field with uh, gravity, turned out to, to be a rather non-trivial modification to the Higgs sector. And this is a twofold modification. First, it changes the kinetic term by making it non-canonical. You can see here the presence of an operator as well as a rescale, an overall rescaling by powers of conformal factor. And also it rescales the potential. This is actually something that will come back later. And uh, yeah, uh, let me note that uh, in what follows, I'm not gonna distinguish between M and M Planck. They're roughly of the same order of magnitude for all practical purposes. So yeah. for inflation, which will be the topic of my talk here, I'm gonna focus only on inflation. Uh, field values over M Planck square over Xi. And in this particular limit, the action simplifies considerably. So the conformal factor only contains the xi h squared term. And in this particular limit, we realize that uh, the action takes a very suggestive form uh, because uh, its form dictates that we canonicalize the field h by employing an exponential map in a new, uh, with a new field, chi, in terms of which we have a canonical kinetic term and an exponential potential. And this is exactly the reason uh, why this uh, works, because chi may be thought of as the, as the pseudo number Goldstein boson associated with symmetry breaking of dilatation when moving from the original Jordan frame to the Einstein frame. Now, exponentially, uh, exponential closeness to the sitter means a very flat potential, and a very, a very flat potential translates into really nice predictions as far as inflationary observables uh, are concerned. Uh, so we have an SNR uh, really you know, spot on the Planck uh, data. And also, as I said before, the normalization of the power spectrum tells us that Xi should be a large number of the order 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Now, that's all I wanted to say about uh, Higgs inflation. And actually, that's all you need to, to know uh, in order to, to follow what I'm going to be discussing now, which is the self-consistency of the theory. Now, we have standard model and we have gravity, and we combine this, uh, these guys together. What we end up with is a non-normalizable theory, and by definition, this non-normalizable theory will be bound from above by a cutoff. Now, irrespective of whether there is a minimal coupling to gravity or a non-minimal coupling to gravity, uh, 
the sustainable irrespectiveness then of the presence or not of the nominal coupling. What changes is where the strong coupling is where the strong coupling regime starts. In the case of the apps, when we have uh, when we don't have a, non, a minimal coupling, then the strong coupling scale is at the order of uh, the Planck scale itself. Whereas uh, in our particular situation, where a non-minimal coupling between the field and gravity is present, the strong coupling scale may be lower than the Planck scale and actually may be significantly lower than the Planck scale. And of course, a decisive factor as far as self-consistency of the theory is concerned is whether or not the energies of the phenomena that, uh, that we're describing in the theory are lower than this, uh, than this cutoff scale, than this energy scale. Now, uh, it's important to understand that the information about uh, the range of applicability of the theory, it's built in the model itself, okay? And the strategy to extract this information uh, that, uh, that I'm going to undertake here is to perform dimensional analysis. Equivalently, one can compute amplitudes explicitly, but that's a more tedious way to, to, to proceed. Now, uh, first, what one does is fixes the background of the field, the Higgs background in this particular case, to correspond to inflationary dynamics. Of course, had they been talking about different epochs, I would take different background value for it. Then I'm going to study the behavior of perturbations on top of this background. And it's important to realize that the non normalizability of the theory translates into the non-polynomial interactions that we saw before. And non-polynomial interactions give rise to higher dimensional operators for these perturbations. Now, the cutoff, or better say, a lower bound of the cutoff, will be identified with a background dependent scale that suppresses the leading higher dimensional operators coming from this expansion. So, first, I'm going to start uh, by discussing the small field limit and uh, see what happens there. So, the small field limit and not inflation corresponds when Planck scale dominates over the Higgs expectation value, or better say, xi h squared. And what one finds is that in all sectors, scalar sector, gauge sector, fermionic sector, don't forget, we're talking about standard model Higgs. And standard model Higgs interacts with uh, gauge bosons and with failure. Then what we find is that the leading higher dimensional operators come hand in hand with uh, the scale M Planck over Xi. And this is something which is much smaller than M Planck for the values of Xi that I told you before. It's n to the four, don't forget. Now, this is a problem if uh, the cutoff is in Planck over Xi. And it's a problem because during inflation, the Hubble scale is also in Planck over Xi, up to order one coefficient. Means that the, 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 the language that we're using to describe inflationary dynamics is not the appropriate one, or at least there is tension. So uh, it, uh, it may not be a suitable description of uh, this period. Now, uh, I, I was a bit uh, too, too fast because what I'm interested in is the opposite limit, meaning that uh, uh, this is the large field limit where Xi H term dominates over the Planck scale. Then, looking in the scalar sector only, what I would see is uh, a tower of higher dimensional operators. And uh, surprisingly, this, these are all suppressed by Planck scale. No, no uh, sign of Xi whatsoever there. Now, that would be very nice because during inflation, as I said, we have the relevant energy scale, which is the Hubble parameter. But Hubble parameter is much, much smaller than M Planck. So everything is, would be fine. Of course, I'm a bit too naive uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm saying that because uh, I already discussed that uh, coupling non minimally to gravity Higgs is a radical modification straight to the heart of standard model dynamics. And uh, let's understand what happens and why this is the case. Uh, yeah, let me, as a side note, uh, what, what we've been doing here is working in the unitary gauge, meaning that we have a single field in the scalar sector. So it, uh, it may seem that it's too simple, okay? And uh, I've wrote here trivial inside quotations, Mark, but please uh, take this uh, very loosely. It's not trivial at all. It gives us very interesting uh, cosmological phenomenology. Trivial in the sense that it's a, scale, it's a single field, we can do field definitions and so on, and work always with canonical normalized variables. Of course, this also may give the wrong impression that issues completely disappear since this is the case. And uh, uh, let me make it clear that uh, this does not happen. It's simply that the problem shifts, changes location, changes sector. Okay, so let's forget for the moment about inflation, about Higgs inflation and focus on standard model. And more specifically, I want to understand what happens with longitudinally polarized gauge bosons and uh, processes, scattering processes involving these guys. 
So uh, we know that uh, the, the, the gauge portions that act uh, uh, through terms that come from the non-abelian field strength and give rise to cubic and, cubic and quantic vertices. And in turn, these uh, correspond to diagrams of the form that I've uh, sketched here, that these uh, asymptote at uh, high energies, the, the, the behavior with, uh, at high energies goes like energy squared. Okay? Here, for the sake of uh, being uh, complete, I wrote explicitly the, the amplitude and involves the gauge coupling G and also the mass of the gauge boson, which normally, conventionally, when we study this process, it's on top of the electroweak vacuum. And it's given by the gauge coupling times the expectation, the electroweak expectation value of the Higgs field. Now, uh, that would be very problematic because uh, the amplitude diverges. Okay? But hope, uh, it's, it's, it's very fortunate that actually, okay, fortunate, it's the Higgs mechanism. Uh, and uh, the Higgs mechanism guarantees that this, uh, these guys are well behaved due to, the self due to the interaction of the Higgs field with uh, the vector bosons coming from the covariant derivative. And as you can see here, it's the contribution of diagrams involving the physical Higgs excitation also goes, has exactly the same behavior. And this delicate cancellation, uh, it's uh, what uh, guarantees uh, the, the good behavior, the good high energy behavior of the sector of the standard model. Now, back to Higgs inflation. What we did by coupling the field non minimally to gravity, I presented it before, is that we modified the kinetic term for the field. And by, but apart from that, of course, uh, we also uh, altered the gauge bosons dynamics partially in the following sense. First of all, we uh, gave the, the, the vector bosons an effective mass, an effective inflationary mass, which is proportional to m Planck over square root of xi. At the same time, we practically decoupled the Higgs excitation from the gauge bosons, okay? Because uh, the interactions turn out to be exponentially suppressed. Now, at the same time, the vector kinetic and self-interaction terms, which are contained in the abelian and non-abelian field strengths, are completely unaffected from moving to the, from the Jordan to Einstein frame and vice versa. And the heart of the problem, the crux of the problem, is really this partial modification of gauge dynamics. And uh, this is a sketch of what I said in work before. We still have the non-abelian gauge fields interacting through their uh, field strength. And still, the longitudinal components of the vector bosons uh, behave uh, uh, as the amplitudes of these processes uh, asymptote uh, to energy square. Now, of course, the mass uh, is the inflationary mass proportional to Planck over square root of psi. And that, but now, we don't, what we don't have is the compensation from the Higgs interaction, from the physical Higgs interaction with these guys. Okay. This means that this cancellation cannot take place. This means that the unitarity is violated at the inflationary mass of the gauge explosion. So in other words, at M Planck over square root of Xi. Okay. And this is actually the cutoff of, uh, of uh, the theory during inflation. Now, I've also sketched here the big picture, okay, the full, uh, the full uh, evolution of the cutoff. It's a background dependent quantity, so we don't expect it to be constant in M Planck over square root of Xi all the way to the present epoch. And indeed, during inflation, it's M Planck over square root of Xi. Then during the reheating of the universe, it, uh, it decays with uh, power of the field square. And then it reaches, it, it, it relaxes to its present day value, which is M Planck over Xi in agreement with the, with the expectation that we have by expanding the action in the small field regime uh, that we saw before. So it's quite reasonable to ask what happens if we did not employ unitary gates for these computations. And the reason why it's logical is to, to realize that once we do not do that, the scalar sector, it's not so trivial because it involves the, the, the would be number Goldstone modes uh, that are written by the gates fields and become actually the longitudinal components. And uh, it's quite, quite reasonable to wonder if something can really change. And uh, yeah, let's, let's understand. I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is nothing can change. It's simply that uh, uh, you know, the problem again shifts to a different sector of the theory. And uh, this is expected in one way or another because actually the number calls the most, as I already said, are the longitudinal components of the vector. Now, before actually going to, to, to the discussion of Higgs inflation itself, uh, in, in uh, you know, 
of the scalar sector. Let me give you a toy model that really captures the essence of what happens there. Uh, take two scalar fields, phi one and phi two, in flat four-dimensional space time. The action that captures the dynamics of this guy is uh, the one you can see here. It involves the standard kinetic term for these guys, plus uh, some higher dimensional operators involving derivatives of the field. Now, at first sight, it's tempting to say that we have a theory of two fields interacting non-trivially through derivative mixings. And uh, the scale that appears suppressing these operators, this lambda tilde, is actually the cutoff. It's the, the, uh, the upper bound of, uh, of, uh, of the energy scale where my theory is applicable. Now, at second thought, what we have here is two massless fields which are completely coupled from each other, and lambda is uh, a spurious scale that appears only from a not so uh, smart choice of variables. And uh, this becomes clear because we can complete the square and introduce new fields, high one and high two, yet another field of definition. Let me know that when it comes to scalar tensor theories and so on, it's always a matter of doing field of definitions, uh, to, to finding the appropriate field of definition to untangle the dynamics and actually you know, see what happens. And this is the case also in the toy model here, which of course is inspired by you know, the real situation. So in terms of high one and high two, we have uh, the true nature of the toy model uh, revealed. So two completely massless decoupled scalar fields, high one. So uh, let me give you an example of a parameterization of the Higgs doublet, which uh, can result into uh, <clears throat> uh, a situation that uh, one can misinterpret some scales uh, that appear explicitly in the action with a cutoff. So uh, now we need to focus only on the kinetic sector for the Higgs doublet H. And in the Einstein frame, this reads uh, as here. So there is the rescaling with a conformal factor plus this uh, higher dimensional operator. Don't forget, I showed you the body, the unitary gauge body of this, uh, of this uh, guy. Okay, omega as before is the conformal factor that uh, depends on H dagger H. Now, uh, let's see what, uh, what happens. To understand, we write the Higgs doublet in its Cartesian form. H bar as before is the background, H is the physical Higgs, and pi's are the would-be number Goldstone modes. Now, the strategy I'm going to follow is to take H, plug into the action, and expand in powers of pi and H. I'm going to keep terms which are most quartic in the perturbations. Remember that we're talking about, uh, uh, we're interested in two to two scattering processes. And uh, once I expand, I'm going to normalize canonically the kinetic terms by some trivial uh, multiplicative rescaling that depend on the background, and then consider the inflationary limit. Once I effectuate all these steps and uh, doing some massaging, I'm going to end up with uh, an action that reads uh, as, if, uh, as I've presented here. So it involves uh, four scalar fields, high and sigma and three sigma A's, and uh, surprisingly, it also seems that the leading higher dimensional operator, uh, higher dimensional operators are suppressed by a scale which is much lower than Planck over square root of Xi, and rather it's Planck over Xi. It's the, the low energy cutoff. Okay? And uh, uh, if I'm fair, and if I want to follow the logic that I presented before, uh, dimensional analysis tells me that uh, the lowest uh, scale that appears in my actions in Planck of Xi, and this must be identified with a cutoff. So it seems that there is sort of confusion here. What is going on? How come, what are we missing by using different variables? And the answer to this question is that we're not missing anything. There is no confusion. Just like in the toy model, we can complete the square and uh, make this, uh, introduce a new field uh, to make canonical the kinetic terms. And in terms of the canonical normalized fields, we find that uh, M Planck over Xi completely disappears from the action. And uh, uh, the only scale that appears there, as it should, is M Planck over square root of Xi, which is the genuine cutoff uh, of the theory for inflationary backgrounds. Okay, the exact expressions do not matter. You can take my word for that. <clears throat> no. Uh, so, what is the take-home message uh, up to this point? Uh, first of all, it's important to make sure that uh, redundancies of this sort are eliminated. 
And uh, even if they're not eliminated, one can go ahead and compute, say, amplitudes and so on for these processes involving the highs and pies. But uh, one should make sure to check that these are order and Planck over Xalvanis, as they should. And uh, yeah, it, it all co comes down to the fact that uh, a better choice of variables is in order. Okay? And actually, one uh, does not need to go far to find these uh, this, uh, uh, variables. And it's actually the standard, the, the customary, you know, the usual uh, angular representation for the Higgs field. Of course, other parameterizations are possible. Actually, Sebastian came up with uh, yet another one, which also serves the purpose very nice. Uh, for, the, for, uh, for here, I just want to, to, to show you what happens if we employ the standard exponential parameterization for the Higgs doublet. Again, we take the scalar sector. We don't confine ourselves to unitary gates, so Higgs doublet appears explicitly. But now we write it uh, in the form that we're used to writing it when we're studying you know, standard model physics. Again, H bar is the background, H is the Higgs field, the physical Higgs excitation, and the pi's are the would be number Goldstone modes. And now the only new ingredient is tau, which is the Pauli matrix. Okay? Now, as before, exactly as before, my, methodolo my methodology consists of the following steps I take H and I plug it into the action. Uh, and after expanding in powers of H and pi, I look, at, I look at, the, uh, at the terms which are at most quartic in the perturbations. After canonically normalizing the kinetic terms and considering the limit relevant from inflation, if my logic goes through, I should find immediately what is the cutoff scale. And to no surprise, we end up with something that uh, indeed uh, makes it possible to, to immediately you know, read off the cutoff of the theory for inflation without the need for this intermediate uh, field of definition. Simply by making by 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 uh, you know making a how say, smarter choice of variables to start. Now, another reasonable question to do is what would happen if we modify gravity and modify gravity. I mean, uh, treat gravity uh, not in its standard Einstein uh, Einstein incarnation, but rather say, for instance, in Palatini formulation or in Einstein Cartan formulation and so on. For the purpose of illustration, I'm discussing here only Palatini, with generalization being quite straightforward. Now, the logic is exactly the same, but now the different nature of uh, uh, gravity translates into the absence of this higher dimensional operator that shifts the kinetic term for the Higgs. Okay? And uh, this can be pinpointed back, all the way back, to the fact that scalar curvature uh, does not shift in homogeneous under violent scaling by going from the Jordan to Einstein frame. It, uh, it, it transforms uh, only homogeneously. Now, this again means that the scalar sector is much simpler. Again, much simpler and trivial and so on. I use these words very loosely, okay? For a lack of better alternative of world, okay? It's not simple at all. It gives very satisfactory cosmological phenomenology, okay? Uh, in any way, as compared to the metric case, we don't have this extra uh, operator in, uh, in, the, in the kinetic term but rather only rescaling by power of conformal factor. And again, okay, it's reasonable to ask whether or not self-consistency as far as inflation is concerned, uh, what happens with the self-consistency? Now, uh, the answer to this question is actually well known. Nothing changes. Uh, it's exactly the same logic as before. We modify partially the gauge dynamics by giving the gauge bosons effective masses, which are uh, for inflation proportional to M Planck over square root of Xi. Again, we have the Higgs excitations coming from the covariant derivative, or, or say, yeah, I mean, uh, the covariant derivative also gets rescaled by one of her omega. Okay, this translates into the excitations being very suppressed, not exponentially, but still very, very suppressed as compared to the metric formulation. And again, this nullifies the Higgs mechanism that is responsible for canceling the diverging part of the amplitude. And actually, this brings me to my conclusions. And uh, yeah, uh, what I wanted to, to discuss is that uh, if standard model has been responsible for inflating our universe, then the predictions, first of all, are in excellent agreement with latest observational data. And uh, although this, uh, this, uh, this theory is rather non-trivially modified as compared to the standard vanilla, uh, to, to the vanilla standard model that we're used to discussing around electro vacuum, Higgs inflation is a self-consistent, weakly coupled effective theory. 
And depending on the choice of gauge, one needs to be a bit careful in order to look uh, at the appropriate sector to identify the range of amoebitor of the theory. And once this uh, sector is uh, uh, found, one should be careful to, uh, to understand better whether or not there are artifacts or the redundancies and so on when uh, not an appropriate choice of variables is uh, being made. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the very clear talk. So let us see whether there are questions. Please uh, raise your hand, whoever has a question to ask or make a comment to make. Should I go first? Nobody's raising, I mean, am, am I not seeing hands or? No, nobody yet. So I have a question. I have a, sure. I have a, a probably very naive question. Um, so why don't you just do the following? You, you stay in the standard model completely concerning the gravity mm -hmm. sector and uh, modify the Higgs potential such that at large field excursions, it becomes flat. Uh, and exponentially, exponentially flat as you did. Because in the end, this is kind of the theory you end up with, right? So I could as but, well but that's what, from that theory. That's what I'm doing, literally. That's literally what I'm doing. It's just I'm not modifying the potential per se. I'm allowing for the field to interact with gravity and do the job for me. But, but why, after all, but I mean, what, what's the difference? Is, is, there, is, there, is there conceptually any difference I mean, if I just- it's, I think it's conceptual. It's the difference conceptual. I mean, that's, that's what I would- uh, I mean, the, this is, first of all, this kind of term here, it's the only term I can write down, which is polynomial in the field, up to dimension four, right? And also, even if I don't include it, it will be in one way or another generated via loop effects, right? So take standard model, couple it to Einstein gravity, I'm gonna generate at one loop this term, this chi h squared times r. Of no, course, with not, fixed coefficient. Yeah, yeah, the coefficient is too large. It, 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 I mean, once you accept that you are doing something which I would call unnatural, I mean, but I'm happy to accept it, it's not a criticism, then I may as well just write down exponential potential. I, I guess my, my question is a background question, which is uh, my confusion that some people claim that you know they can just take this another model and try run it to high energies and see that the Higgs potential in fact turns over and becomes unstable. You know yeah, this, this, uh, this may not be the case, right? This depends on the top quark mass, and it's my understanding that. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's accept. Some... Yeah, yeah. But, but let's let's choose the top quark mass to be. Uh, at borderline experimentally acceptable such that this happens. Yeah. Would this, would this, why doesn't this happen in your model? Because apparently, according to what you said, you have the right to just modify the exponential and make it at large values not turn over, but rather become exponentially flat. So is there a conflict? To me, there seems to be a conflict between, between the work on Higgs instability at large uh, energies and your claim. No, but this no, is I don't example. think actually, this has been studied before by Saposnikov, Rubio, Bezrukov, and so on. What happens if actually, say, the vacuum is, is metastable? That's probably what you are saying. So what happens around the border of metastability, for instance, with this potential? Yes, yes. And still, inflation is possible. It's possible. Still, inflation goes through, even in this situation. No, but you seem to have the freedom to choose a flat potential while... Uh, uh, the computer stability community claims that they can calculate unambiguously the turnover and the instability. Okay, sorry, yeah, maybe again, I, I, this, I'm too this thing. Yeah. This thing again. I have to insist that depends on the top quark mass on the on the top yukawa. If the top yeah, the let, top let, yukawa let, is yeah, such that sure. it's not, yeah. But let's again, take, let's even if it's metastable, I, I, I understand. But even if it's metastable, inflation still may happen. I mean, uh, this has been. Uh, I think Answer, Michel, this question has been answered. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Okay. There's a question by Misha Shabashev. Please. Uh, well, uh, sorry. A comment. Yeah. yeah uh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, not a question. Perhaps I can uh, clarify uh, the point which you raised uh, uh, up to, uh, about metastability of the vacuum and uh, what is happening there. If. Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Ah, I okay. mean, as long as, okay. long as there are no questions. Ah. I, I was just, I mean, priority, of course, to people who actually have questions, mm -hmm. but please, please okay. go ahead. Uh, actually, I can uh, show you uh, a plot, but for, for doing so, uh, maybe 
Uh, I can uh, share the screen, but uh, you need me to stop sharing. Will, uh, yeah. Yeah. Please, 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 please go ahead. I mean, we have we still have uh, about eight minutes or so, so we have time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, if you see my screen, okay, so this is uh, the picture of, uh, of metastability. Okay, and so let me explain what uh, uh, is inside uh, this picture. So first of all, uh, this axis here, uh, this is uh, the uh, top work you cover coupling. Okay, and this is uh, top work you cover coupling. Uh, to be very, very precise, it's taken in MS, uh, MS bar scheme at uh, some particular value, okay? And uh, this axis here uh, is uh, uh, the mass of the Higgs boson, and uh, there are some central values uh, for uh, this measure of quantities, and in particular, uh, central uh, value for the top uh, quark mass is the one which is taken from the latest CMS measure. So it's actually interesting to look at uh, the uh, way the top work mass changes in time. So when the Higgs was discovered, the top work mass was 173 GeV, and now uh, it's moving uh, down. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is uh, the, mm, uh, uh, the central point corresponds to this measurement, and these are the error bars uh, literally uh, taken from uh, what experimentalists says, uh, say that uh, I would say that uh, the errors, systematic errors is in mass of the top work are in fact uh, underestimated and they are large. So, and um, this line here, it's a, indeed a theoretical computation which shows whether you have uh, metastability, stability, etc. And uh, the width uh, of this uh, curve is again the, the errors in the computations which are associated with higher loops and also with the determination of alpha strong. Okay, so first of all, you see that uh, the evidence that uh, the vacuum is uh, metastable is extremely poor. It's not uh, more than one sigma. Okay, okay, so. Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah. The I, 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 mean, ask, I was asking as a theorist. I was not asking as a technologist. I was wondering about the potential conflict. So, if the parameters are such that we are metastable, yeah. I if uh, okay, at the same uh, time, yeah. at the same time, have a prediction of instability and uh, Higgs inflation. That is what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm coming to that. Okay, so uh, my first statement was that uh, the experimental evidence that uh, there is this metastability is very poor. Okay, but uh, let's uh, take this point of view that uh, this is indeed the case. And then uh, we should ask ourselves whether a fixed inflation is possible or not, okay? And uh, the answer cannot be given uh, definitely because of, uh, of the following reason. Uh, once you uh, include gravity, uh, and uh, as uh, Georgios uh, discussed, uh, uh, this is a non uh, normalizable theory. And therefore, the uh, behavior of uh, different couplings, in particular the Higgs uh, self coupling, which is important for the issue of stability and uh, metastability, is uh, changing. Okay? And it's certainly changing. And how does it change? We cannot uh, see from the point of view of the standard model. We need an extra information, okay? And depending on this extra information, uh, you can see that in spite of the fact the vacuum is metastable, Higgs inflation is still possible, or it can happen so that uh, the uh, vacuum is metastable and Higgs inflation is impossible. But we cannot decide uh, so because uh, that requires uh, the knowledge of uh, the UV completion. I see. So, you, so, so in a naive language, that requires the knowledge of certain higher dimension operators, which come yeah, in uh, yeah, affect that's correct. the running and normalization. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, okay, very good. Uh, I, I understood. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was my. That was. Uh, yeah, I was missing that point. Thank you. Yeah. So we heard it from the expert. The, the issue of metastability. <laughs> yes, indeed, yeah. So one of you, indeed, your co-author is an uh, 
leader so, in both so sides, on both, both sides, fixed inflation and middle stability. So, <laughs> yes. Um, there's also a question in the chat. Um, uh, right. Let me read out the question from the chat. I don't see it. Why don't I see it? I see the raised hand. Also. Ah, so, sorry. It was it was a private to me. No, sorry. Oh, and, okay, and okay, 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 okay. the raised okay. hand. Yeah, sorry. Good. Uh, but but uh, there's a question uh, from Andreas uh, uh, Manziris. Uh, so please, uh, please go ahead and ask. Unmute yourself and ask. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes very good. Uh, yeah, just yeah, to, to join this discussion about metastability, because we're working on this with, um, with R2, Rayante at Imperial. And I have, um, I've done uh, very recently the plot of the running of Lambda for the latest uh, the direct, at least, measurements for the top. So I can, I can show you this if, if you want. And for the direct uh, mass measurements for the top quark, it seems that the metastability is kind of more, uh, it, it, it pushes towards metastability rather than stability. Um, you, you, you may share something. I mean, we still have, uh, we have uh, three minutes roughly. Uh, sure, so let me if, you, if you want to share, I think I need to make you a co-host. Oh, I see, I see, I see. I, see. I can do that, uh, I, I did already, yeah. So you can share the plot. Yeah. Can you see? Yes. yes. Okay. And again, this I stress again, because that's the point that the Jorg was also made about the top quark. So this is the direct mass measurement for the top quark. So, and this has the uh, smallest uncertainty. Um, so of course, yeah, maybe this is wishful thinking, but anyway, so the central yeah, black line is the, the, the central measurements. And then at three loop, um, uncertainty in the top quark, which is the, the third line, the dust dotted, uh, lambda is uh, turns uh, negative. So in this, uh, so when lambda turns negative, you still have metastability. It, it has to remain positive, right? For you to not have metastability. So uh, this is a very recent plot that I calculated with um, Fedor Bezrukov's uh, mathematical notebook that everyone uses, right, for the, for the running. Uh, and I just, uh, because it's relevant, I think, to the discussion, I just wanted to show you, like, this is with the uh, particle data um, uh, uh, group numbers from 2020, so the more recent ones. Uh, and for this plot, it wasn't calculated since 2018, I think. Um, so okay. it, it seems that it goes towards, uh, well, still, uh, absolute stability is always uh, viable, at least with, with our uh, uncertainties, but it's it seems that... It, it wants to go more to the metastability region. So I just wanted to, to make this point and, and show you the plot, but uh, yeah, I don't want to take more of from, from your time. No, no, very good. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, and can I, uh, can I, I think, think Mitchell wants to, want to Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, the number which I see on this plot is 172.76, uh, which is indeed an official number from particle data group. The plot which I showed to you is based on uh, this year CMS uh, published paper in which yeah. uh, the top quark mass is one GeV smaller, and this uh, yeah. moves everything up. Yeah, just to, and uh, this is very sensitive to the. <laughs> to okay. Sure, 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 and, uh, and uh, the one sigma here uh, is. 0.3 GV, so three sigma would be at 0.9. So let's say one GV uh, lower mass would be, I think, right at where this, a little bit like where the yellow one would be. So that the central value at least. Uh, so maybe, okay, then if you had uh, one, two, three sigma uncertainty, so you, you go higher and higher. But uh, I think just the point is that beta stability seems to survive still maybe is, it's not, uh, yeah, I don't know how many sigma we can claim that it's still there, but uh, central value, I think it still seems to be pointing out there. At least, you know, this is uh, from metastability community, how, how we are phrasing it. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for, for the uh, this comment and the nice discussion. Uh, I feel I have to apologize to Jorgos that I kind of gave away <laughs> this discussion to another discussion. No, uh, but I think fine, it's fine. It's closely related, so I think that's the purpose of the workshop. So I hope everybody exactly, is happy. Exactly. Uh, but now it's already eleven oh one, and I guess we should move to the next to the next uh, talk. So um, 
Yeah, uh, where is Siski Resonant? Ah, you are there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can, can hear you. So, so let me uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, Siski Resonant is going to tell us about Higgs inflation as a door to gravity. Please, go ahead. Thank you. And I actually decided that maybe window is a better uh, metaphor. Uh, so uh, Higgs inflation was already discussed in the previous talk, so let me uh, just uh, cover it briefly and just go directly to the action since the rationale was sort of a bit discussed. Uh, so if you take the standard model action, where here again we have only the radial uh, Higgs mode, and you take and you put it together with general relativity, so you have the Einstein-Hilbert action, and there is exactly one dimension for term that you can write when you put these theories together, that you could not write otherwise. And that is this term uh, Xi H squared R, uh, where you have the Higgs field, the Ricci scalar, and then you have a uh, con the constant, non minimum coupling Xi. And as was mentioned in the previous talk, this Xi is actually not a constant. So even if you want to put it to zero at the classical level, renormalization will generate it for you. And if you put it to zero at one scale, it will run. So this constant is definitely there. The question is, what is the value of this constant? Uh, and if this constant is large, uh, then uh, it enables uh, to use the standard model Higgs, uh, the only fundamental scalar field that we know of, uh, as the inflaton, as was realized by Beshtukov and Shaposhnikov uh, in 2007. And uh, the previous speaker already explained how to go to the Einstein frame action. So we shift this non-standard coupling between Higgs and gravity completely into the particle physics sector. So we have standard gravity, and here I use units in which M Planck is one, because I can't be bothered to carry it around. Uh, then we have this canonical kinetic term, a potential, uh, and this conformal transformation of the metric shifts the effects of the non-minimal coupling to the scalar field potential, so for large, Higgs field values, the potential goes like h to power four. Uh, the, non the square of the non minimal coupling, which appears here, which just comes from the determinant, goes like h squared squared. So this is uh, asymptotically flat. And uh, because of the uh, sh shift from the field h to this canonical field, then in fact, in terms of the canonical field, this potential is exponentially flat. So this is great for inflation. Uh, and in the standard model, you can calculate how reheating happens. So this is the there's usually there's an uncertainty in inflationary models that you don't know what reheating is. If you just have the standard model or some or standard model plus something that doesn't uh, modify the standard model a lot, uh, then uh, you know what happens. Uh, so although there is still a bit of debate because there is an instability in preheating, but uh, so it's. So there is debate over whether reheating is four e folds or essentially or less than one e fold, but this is a small detail. Uh, you get spectral index 0 0.96, tensor to scalar ratio uh, five times 10 to minus three. And this, the only free parameter uh, in this game is Xi and Xi does not affect these numbers. Uh, so Xi divided by square root of lambda, which is the quadric coupling, uh, determines the amplitude of the CMB and unsaturities. But these uh, spectral quantities do not depend on it. So if you compare this to observations, uh, then Higgs inflation is here. So it's in the, the spectral index is in the middle uh, of the observation range. And the uh, tensor to scalar ratio R uh, is about a factor of seven below the current uh, upper limit, so and in within reach of the next generation of CMB experiments, such as Lightbird. Um, now, this prediction, however, has been questioned very early on uh, from the point of view of quantum corrections, namely uh, that this prediction may depend on what is the ultraviolet particle physics completion of the standard model. So what kind of uh, particles you have there? So in the previous talk already, there was this discussion of this cutoff. So what happens beyond the cutoff? Does the physics beyond the uh, cutoff influence uh, 
the Higgs inflation. So this is a, a relevant question. I want to focus on another issue, namely not on what is the full set of particle physics degrees of freedom, but what is the full set of gravitational degrees of freedom and how do they affect uh, Higgs inflation? So, uh, and so far I discussed gravity in the metric formulation <clears throat> and where the only gravitational degree of freedom is the metric. So you have the metric, the levi civita connection in build, is built from the, from the derivatives of the metric. And then you calculate the Riemann curvature terrorism built from the levi civita connection. And this then describes gravity. But this is a one possibility only, because in general, the metric and the connection describe completely different aspects of a general manifold. So metric describes distances in space-time and also dot products of vectors. And connection tells you what are straight lines in space-time and what are derivatives of vectors. And the metric formulation is a constraint possibility where you say that those lines that give you ex local extrema of distance are straight. But you don't have to make this choice. A priori, these connections of uh, these concepts of distance and, and straightness have, have nothing to do with each other. So to look at this uh, uh, more concretely, uh, the metric formulation is, <clears throat> uh, in the metric formulation, the only gravitational tensor is the Riemann curvature tensor, which is built from the 10 components of the metric. So this one direction here stands for 10 directions of the metric formulation. As an alternative, you could say the curvature is zero. And instead we move along this line where gravity is completely described by torsion, which is the anti-symmetric part of the connection, which then has uh, 24 degrees of freedom. This is called the teleparallel formulation of gravity. Or you can say, no, the curvature is zero, the torsion is zero, gravity is completely described by non-metricity. So the covariant derivative of the metric, in which case you have 40, functional degrees of freedom. This got the symmetric telepalala formulation. Uh, or you can apply constraints, for example, that you lie along this wall here. So for example, you have curvature and torsion, but no non-metricity. This is called einstein cartan theory. Or you can say, okay, let me not apply a priori any constraints. This is called the Palatini formulation, sometimes called the metric affine. So sometimes people call Palatini when you're moving on this wall. So the torsion is zero, but I use the word Palatini to describe the case when you don't apply any constraints. So in the metric formulation, the non-metricity and torsion are put to zero a priori. And in the Palatini formulation, instead you let everything uh, be determined by the equations of motion, or maybe we we'll put a constraint on Q, maybe put a constraint on T. In principle, we can also put a constraint on combination of them or on combination of the, them and the curvature. And the teleparallel formulation is then just like the metric formulation, except you put the curvature and the non-metricity to zero. So you can also look at it from the point of view of Lagrange multipliers. So you have your action and you have all these tensors, and then you just put a Lagrange multiplier in the action to put some of them zero. Or, uh, and then, for example, the metric formulation of Lagrange multiplier would then say that this non-metricity is zero, distortion is zero. So then you get a set of 64 constraint equations as the solution of which you get the levi civita connection. Uh, now, I, would, I don't actually like to call these modified theories of gravity. I would rather call them alternative theories in the sense that if, you start, if you're in the metric formulation, and you have the Einstein-Hilbert action R, of the Ricci scalar, and then you add alpha R squared. Then this is a modification of the original action that builds on it. But these, the teleparallel formulation, the Palatini formulation in some sense, they do not build on the metric formulation. They are not different branches, they're different roots. Uh, and, they're, and it's important to note that they are uh, all, in a, uh, all equally valid formulations, and for the simplest action, like the Einstein-Hilbert action, they are also physically equi uh, equivalent as far as observations go. So they're conceptually very different, but the predictions are the same. And it's then a matter of taste, which one do you want to use? However, 
if the gravity action is not the simplest, for example, you have an R squared term, or uh, matter couples to the connection, in this case, the formulations are really physically distinct theories. And here is where we get back to Higgs inflation. Uh, as I noted, you necessarily have a non-minimal coupling between the Higgs and the Ricci scalar, which of course depends on the connection. So Higgs field, the Higgs field breaks the equivalence between these different formulations of uh, GR. You know, Higgs exists, so we know that nature is described by scalar tensor theory. And for scalar tensor theories, these formulations are inequivalent. Uh, let's discuss, so, so uh, in the previous talk, there was a discussion of this uh, very nice work on uh, what happens to unitarity. Uh, let me discuss a different aspect, start with a different aspect of differences, namely <clears throat> the, something that's related directly to observables, uh, namely in the Palatini formulation of Higgs inflation, the gravitational wave amplitude is small. And the origin of this is that both in the metric case and the Palatini formulation, <clears throat> now we are starting with the same action. You just have the Ricci scalar coupled to the square of the Higgs field. You do a conformal transformation to go to the minimally coupled <clears throat> canonical field. Uh, but in the Palatini case, the conformal transformation does nothing uh, to the connection. I mean, in the metric case, if you change the metric, the Levisivita connection, which depends on the metric, changes. So the uh, Ricci changes. That's not true in the Palatini formulation. In the Palatini formulation, uh, things are simpler. In fact, the, uh, the action depends on the, does not depend on derivatives for the metric. So in fact, the metric is an auxiliary field. And when you do this, you don't get any de derivatives of this conformal factor. So the effective potential is flatter. And this was realized by Bauer and Amir very quickly after the Besserkov and Shaposhnikov <laughs> proposal of Higgs, inf Higgs inflation uh, in the metric formulation. So in the metric formulation, uh, the potential, which we saw in the previous talk in the beginning is this. So it's exponentially suppressed with a factor of order unity and the exponent. And in the Palatini formulation, instead, we have uh, square root of Xi in the exponent. And in the Palatini formulation, Xi can be of the order 10 to the minus 10. So you're exponentially, exponentially flat. So you have E2 minus 10 to the 5 chi. So the potential is, uh, is very flat, uh, as a result of which uh, the slower parameter epsilon is small, so the tensor to scalar ratio is small. So if you compare the predictions of the metric case and the Palatini case, in the metric case, scalar to tensor ratio is one, or, one order of magnitude, less than one order of magnitude below the current constraints. And in the Palatini case, instead it's about 10 to the minus 13 divided by the Higgs quadratic coupling, so out of reach of any uh, foreseeable experiments. And the reason for this is very simple. Because Xi is uh, large, the potential is very flat, the slower parameter epsilon is small, the amplitude of scalar perturbations, the observed amplitude fixes u divided by epsilon, where epsilon is the slower parameter, epsilon is smaller, so u is smaller, so therefore the scale of inflation is smaller. So it's not that the Palatini formulation is changing the way gravity waves propagate or, or, or anything like that. It's just that the scale of inflation is small. Uh, unitarity uh, was, or it was discussed extensively uh, in the previous talk. So uh, let me just recap that in the Palatini formulation, there is no derivative of this in the action of this conformal uh, factor in the action. Now I've restored the Planck scale. So therefore, the, you get only the scale h divided by square root. So sorry, h is m Planck divided by square root of xi, then something happens. Uh, if you take the derivative, of course, then you also get h is this 1 over xi, uh, which is in the metric case. And this was also noted by Bauer and Demir. So this means that perturbative unitarity is not lost until the around the inflationary scale in the Palatini formulation. Now, it was noted in the previous talk that if you take into account that this uh, uh, cutoff uh, depends on the background field, then in the metric formulation, you also, around the inflationary scale, the cutoff is also this. Nevertheless, because the cutoff is this around the electroweak vacuum, you should say, okay, maybe there is something in physics around M Planck 
uh, provide by XI or maybe some, or some strong coupling like this, which may affect uh, your inflationary predictions. And in the Palatini formulation, the only problem is that, that this is loss of perturbative unitarity in first order perturbation theory is close to the inflationary scale, which is a bit unnerving. Uh, uh, but I would like to emphasize this uh, as an example of a wider issue, that what's happening here is that we are changing the gravity sector. And then by this conformal transformation, we are shifting this new gravitational physics or different gravitational physics to the particle physics sector. So, uh, the, so we get new particle physics, which can change for particle physics issues like, you know, what scattering energy to use the unitarity uh, by uh, addressing what's happening on the gravity sector. Uh, then, so this was all in the context of the minimal act of the minimal non-minimal action for Higgs inflation, where the only new term that you have compared to the standard model plus Einstein Hilbert is this Xi H squared R. Now let's look at extensions. So uh, uh, if it, even if we restrict ourselves to dimension four, at dimension four, you also have the square of the Ricci scalar, you have square of the uh, Ricci tensor, square of the wild tensor. And in the metric case, and these are also generated by quantum corrections. So, and you have the trace anomaly, which uh, is generated by quantum corrections. And in the metric case, when you have higher order terms in the curvature, this leads to equations of motion that are higher order in derivatives. Uh, for R squared or any function of the Ricci scalar, uh, this is not a problem. You just get a new scalar degree of freedom that's healthy. So, and this just means that you have to discuss uh, Higgs inflation, arguably any inflationary model uh, that starts with a scalar field as a two field inflationary model, because you necessarily also have the R squared. But if you add the square of the Ricci tensor, or if you include it, and again, it's generated, you have it, you have an instability. And then the question is how to deal uh, with this instability. This does not happen in the Palatini case. So in the Palatini case, the Ricci tensor does not depend on derivatives of the metric. Again, in fact, the action doesn't contain any derivatives of the metric whatsoever. And it's first order, uh, it's only first order derivatives of the connection. So the real dynamical field is the connection. The metric is an auxiliary field. Uh, and in this case, the higher order curvature terms do not increase the order of the equations. So if you have an R squared term, or if you have include terms that, are, that uh, involve the symmetric part of the Ricci tensor, because in the Palatini case, this Ricci tensor also has an anti-symmetric part, then this just changes the relation between the existing degrees of freedom. So the R squared term just suppresses the tensor to scalar ratio further to leading order in, uh, in slow roll inflation. Uh, with these kinds of terms, you can also modify the spectral index. Um, if you have anti-symmetric part of the Ricci tensor, or if you have more complicated terms, then uh, you can have you can also have problems because although you don't change the order of the equations, it may be that you have wrong signs in the kinetic terms, and this has been discussed a lot in the literature. What I just want to highlight here is the fact that what happens to your modifications of gravity depends which alternative theory of, of gravity you're dealing with. So you say, oh, I have higher order curvature terms, uh, I have instabilities. Uh, maybe the problem is that you're using the metric formulation instead of the Palatini formulation. Uh, so, so this was about extensions that exist both in the metric case and Palatini case and how they are different. Then there are also extensions that do not exist in the metric case that are only in the Palatini case or in these some other alternative formulations. Uh, concretely put, uh, in addition to the curvature tensor, we have two new tensors, the torsion and the non-metricity, both are dimension one, so you can construct lots of terms with them, with them even if you stick to dimension four. Uh, so let me just take uh, two examples. Many have been discussed in the literature. Uh, so let's consider the Holst term and the Niyan term, which can be motivated by loop quantum gravity where they appear. They're included in the action, but you can also just think of them from the point of view of effective field theory. Now we have this term, which I said, okay, it's dimension four. We have to include it. Uh, now here, the Ricci scalar is just a uh, Riemann tensor completely contracted. You sum over the indices, contract with the metric. You can also take the Riemann tensor and contract it with the Levi-Civita tensor. In the metric formulation, this term is zero, 
because the Riemann tensor is, uh, the, if you anti-symmetrize the Riemann tensor in the last three indices, it vanishes. That's not the case here. In the Palatini formulation, and you can write this in terms of the non-metricity and torsion. But there is no reason not to include this term. As the same dimensionalities appear, you know, exactly on the same grounds as the Ricci scalar. And so you couple it to a constant, just a M Planck square here, and then you have this H squared term, just to have Xi H squared here. And then the Niyan term, uh, which is uh, appears in loop, loop onto gravity, uh, is the you have the torsion tensor, you take the covariant derivative, and again contract with the Levi Civita tensor. This is dimension two. So again, you multiply it by h squared and you get the dimension four term. And so if you just introduce these uh, two terms with these three new constants, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and scan over the inflationary parameter space, you have a big effect on the predictions of Higgs inflation. So here star is the prediction of the metric case. So here we have tensor scalar ratio. This is five to 10 to minus three. <clears throat> this is a spectral index and the color is just the <clears throat> non-minimal, the non-minimal coupling of the to the Ricci scalar here we have here I just saw Xi being positive, Xi being negative also gives you good inflationary models. <clears throat> so here Xi goes to zero, this is 10 to minus five, this is one, 10 to five, and then bigger. And this line is plateau inflation. So basically just as in the metric case, <clears throat> in the Palatini case, the simplest possibility is that you have this asymptotically flat plateau. <clears throat> and in the Palatini case, uh, the tensor to scalar ratio depends, and the spectral index also depends a little bit on the value of, of, of Xi. And then if you include these terms, then you see that the, not only the tensor to scalar ratio can change, but you can also change the spectral index. And all, every single colored point here satisfies all the observational constraints, apart from the spectral index, which here I've shown a wider range than what is observed. But basically you can get any spectral index you want. So uh, this is uh, so this means that the predictions of uh, Higgs inflation then uh, are not unique; uh, they uh, uh, widen up. And let me say a few words. So that was all in the Palatini. Let me say a few words about teleparallel. Again, the teleparallel formulation. <clears throat> uh, which, like the Palatini formulation, was dis was discussed by Einstein after he uh, had formulated the, uh, written down the metric formulation. So in the teleparallel formulation, uh, the curvature is zero. So the manifold is completely flat. And in the basic teleparallel <clears throat> version, non-metricity is also zero. So instead, you have torsion. So you have like a force that pushes particles of geodesics, but with the but with the uh, with the simplest action. So here you don't do the Ricci scalar, but you have a torsion scalar. Uh, then this is actually, as far as observations are concerned, this is completely equivalent to the usual formulation. Now we can ask, what happens if you add this non-minimal coupling? And actually here, uh, there's a bit of a surprise that if you do the same that you did in the uh, metric case or Palatini case, there you have the Ricci scalar multiplied by a constant, and then you add h squared times r. Here you have torsion scalar, multiplied by a constant, which is the usual action. Then you say, let me multiply this torsion scalar by h squared. And it turns out that the theory is not consistent, or at least let me be careful. In, if, you look at linear, if you look at inflation, you look at linear order perturbations around firmer Betz walker uh, then there are no scalar perturbations, not in. Uh, so the theory is probably sick. Uh, but now if you add more non-minimal couplings, so you say, okay, this doesn't work. Actually, I have to add a coupling to, for example, the torsion vector or to some other new terms, and then I get a healthy theory. So whereas previously you could add these new terms or you, you could opt not to add them, here actually the theory is telling you that no, you cannot go with a minimal non-minimal coupling. You also have to have something else. And if you add these, then in fact you can do, uh, you can massage the action and you can show that, okay, it's actually equivalent to metric cases or Palatini cases. And I think the only, the, all of the healthy teleparallel uh, theories that are known at the moment are physically equivalent to some metric or Palatini theories. There are some theories that may not be equivalent. It's not clear whether they are healthy or not. But if such theories exist, then it's an interesting, case, then it's an interesting point to note that, for example, the unitarity problem 
or other problems at the intersection of gravity and particle physics really uh, have remained to be investigated in the teleparallel case. And even in the cavity sector alone, there are things that are unclear for the teleparallel formulation, which again, let me repeat, is just as valid formulation as the metric. Uh, let me summarize, X inflation is a minimal bottom-up scenario that uses only the known degrees of freedom we have in the particle from particle physics and from gravity. And because Higgs, Higgs couples to the connection, uh, in this case, different formulations of GR are, uh, are inequivalent. So we can say, okay, this has the drawback that predictions of Higgs inflation depend on the formulation. For example, the scalar tension ratio is much smaller in the Palatini formulation in the uh, for the minimal, non-minimal action. Uh, but we can look at it also from the upside, namely that here the Higgs vacuum expectation value, so the background field value during inflation, and the non-minimal couplings, whether they are xi or other couplings, then they provide new gravitational scales. So what, so what these do, is, as, this, as also discussed in the previous talk, they bring down gravitational physics from the Planck scale to lower scales where they can be accessible to inflation. So that's interesting. Uh, and, behave, and the behavior of some formulations of teleparallel gravity, uh, form, some formulations of GR like teleparallel gravity remains to be uh, fully investigated and also what's happening with all these possible terms that you can write. In the Palatini case, for example, uh, remains to be mapped. Um, and I would also like to note that what I say is true in a sense for all models of inflation, because if you have any, or at least all scalar field models. So if you have any scalar field, uh, then you quantum corrections will generate you this non-minimal coupling. And it will be non-zero on some scale. So this means that actually all inflationary models, in a sense, break this symmetry bit, uh, or the equivalence between these different formulations of gravity. The, but it's just a quantitative question. So because Higgs inflation relies on a large non-minimal coupling, so it means that the breaking of the equivalence is significant. And so the differences between these uh, theories are amplified and can be brought on the inflationary scale. So you can use inflation to get uh, information on which formulation of gravity is correct, which I think is quite interesting. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. So um, we have time for questions and comments, of course. Yeah, Huri uh, Siapur, please uh, unmute yourself and speak. Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question from uh, both you and also the previous uh, speaker. Um, considering that any modification of, uh, of um, uh, interaction uh, with Higgs, interaction of gravity with Higgs uh, has uh, an effect practically on everything else, indirectly at least. And also the constraint on the modification of Einstein theory uh, from gravitational waves. Uh, I wanted to know uh, really how much of these uh, models with, uh, with uh, non-standard uh, gravity um, will really survive? Are we, aren't we losing just uh, our time by, uh, by considering this model, for instance, for something like inflation, Higgs inflation, and so on and so forth, as a solution? OK, thank you. So, there are, so, so this is a good question. So there are suicides. One is gravitational waves, and the other is uh, the coupling of Higgs to other particles, so basically uh, collider physics. Uh, so as far as gravitational waves go, so in this uh, models that I discussed, uh, the degrees of freedom are the same as usually. So you have the usual gravitation. So the gravitational waves, uh, so you have only these two propagating degrees of freedom. And in fact, their propagation is not affected here at all. You can, of course, affect them. I mean, you, if you modify gravity, uh, uh, you can have terms that give you, that modify propagation of gravitational waves that, that bring you new degrees of freedom and so on. Uh, but, uh, but here, that's, that's not the case. And if, yeah, but sorry, sorry. You you mentioned in your talk, if I if I uh, if I understood correctly, that uh, for instance in Platini um, uh, formulation, uh, the gravitational waves are uh, somehow suppressed. 
Therefore, uh, if the, this was the case, we had to uh, to see it in the gravitational waves observations. No, uh, because this uh, the amplitude of gravitational waves generated by Higgs inflation, the Palatini formulation is smaller than in the metric formulation because the scale of inflation is smaller. So this is why the amplitude is smaller. There is no, uh, that, that's the only difference. So the difference is not in the gravitational wave sector, the difference, in, the difference is in the scalar sector. Now, as far as particle physics is, uh, is concerned, uh, because, so if we look at the, uh, the modification, so if you look at the modifications, then they come uh, in terms of that you have non-nominal coupling, then you have the field divided by the Planck scale square. So this is, yeah, but uh, this... gives... Sorry, can this... I, can answer... cannot... Let me answer your question. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So, so, as we, so if you look at particle physics, so, okay, so first of all, so these couplings are important during inflation because the Higgs field value is large. But if you look at what's happening today uh, in colliders, and there are there are few papers on collider limits uh, on these normal couplings, then the limits are extremely weak because today the Higgs va field values are very very small. So because of this Planck scale suppression, uh, these these terms are completely negligible, even if xi is ten to the ten. Yes, but you are you are discussing uh, uh, about the uh, uh, collider. Uh, I mean limits. Huh? However, uh, in the um, cosmological, uh, I mean, uh, data, we should, we should see uh, such a difference because uh, the, um, the, the, the gravity changes uh, and even, I mean, the, 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 the interaction between, uh, the, the interaction between, uh, because, the, because X is responsible for the mass, uh, of uh, particles, then the uh, the um, uh, the response of the everything, uh, let's say, uh, uh, would be different uh, with respect to the gravity. We should immediately see a modification uh, of uh, of uh, every uh, gravitational, uh, the, I mean, effect that we see in cosmology. From CMB no. up to here. No, 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 because the Why? because the way because the way the Higgs generates the masses is given. So if you just look at the standard model Lagrange, and there you see the coupling, uh, the the coupling of the Higgs to the W and the Z and the Yukawa couplings to the fermions, and they are indeed modified uh, in these theories, and these modifications are important during inflation, during preheating, but today in today's universe they're negligible because they are all suppressed by this by the Planck scale. Are there more uh, okay. questions uh, uh, and comments? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, uh, thank Andrea, you. Uh, uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, Andreas Mansiris again, please. Uh, hi, yes, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, just a quick question. In that colorful plot towards the end, there was one line that was sur the, uh, surrounded by the blue ones. Yeah. What, what, what's that line? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. This dashed line is the case when xi is zero. So when there is no non-minimal coupling to the Ricci scalar, when we only have this Holst term and the and the uh, and the Niyan term. So in this case, also you have a successful inflationary model. But then you have then you are and this. So, so basically, this line is if you have a fixed number of e-folds. And in this numerical scan, this blue line is when you allow the e-folds vary by plus minus one to allow for difference for differences in reheating. So basically this line is xi equals zero. Uh, but the point was that we, we always generate uh, xi, the, the non-minimal term, so with non-zero xi, no? Yeah, yeah, so, 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 then th so then the realistic version would be that then xi is, uh, uh, the, is, is, so, is negligible compared to these other couplings. So then you are not quite along this line, but also, but somewhere in this blue region. Uh, okay, I see. Okay, thanks very much. Next uh, was Sebastian. Sebastian said. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, so I'm wondering about the, your statement about tele teleparallel. So you said mm. that in the simplest model, when you only have a non-minimal coupling to this teleparallel scalar, then this is not successful. So the, the perturbations yeah. have the wrong behavior. So 
like very naively, I would think, okay, like I have this non-minimal coupling to this teleparallel scalar, and then I have the teleparallel constraint that tells me this teleparallel scalar is equivalent, uh, so it's, it's equal to the the levi civita ritchie scalar. Oh, but, but, then, but that, but that so, sorry, but that's only if you have if it's not minimal. So the torsion scalar is equivalent to this to the levi civita ritchie scalar only if it's minimally coupled. This is not the case if it's not minimally coupled. So, so can you expand on that? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it's a shame I might have thought of an equation at hand. It's basically if you have the, uh, let's say that you write the full Ricci scalar, so using the full connection, then you can decompose this and say that it has a connection from the torsion scalar, from the non metricity scalar, from the curvature scalar, uh, boundary terms of these things, and then coupling terms between torsion and non metricity. And in teleparallel, you say, for example, okay, non metricity is zero, curvature, uh, the total curvature is zero. So then what you have equals zero is torsion scalar plus the Levi Civita Ricci scalar plus boundary terms involving torsion. Now, yep. if this is your full action, then the boundary terms go away. If, now, if you multiply it with a function, these boundary terms then generate some, give you some new, new stuff. And that's the reason for this, for the difference, exactly these boundary terms. All right. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm gonna write you an email about that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Just one more question, but you know. Yes. Uh, so, Suksha, thanks a lot for for the nice talk. Uh, so, so it's not the question. Maybe if if I may, just uh, just a comment on the first question in, in the session, just to clarify. So, the gravitational waves today, like from black hole mergers or neutron star mer mergers, they they are exactly the same. They are not affected at all. So all consequences of gravity uh, are the same. Uh, all predictions, all tests. So these theories, uh, they passed all the same tests. I think uh, what has been mentioned are gravitational waves from inflation, which gives the ten tensor to scalar ratio. And this is what, what is suppressed. But this is not uh, has nothing to do with uh, Liga, Virga, present day gravitational waves. Maybe, no, well, just to clarify, to spell this out again. Yeah, exactly. Think... So. so... Yeah, exactly. So all of this, this is mapped to the scalar sector, not the gravity sector. Okay, very good. Yeah, thank you. It was helpful. Yeah, good. So I don't see any further questions, and we are. Then also... let me make a, ten, 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 let me make a comment on the previous talk. Yeah, please, please. You have so, to have that, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So just on the on this meta stability that I want to add that in addition to this, so this was uh, also alluded to by Misha, so that. Uh, in addition to these theoretical error bars, which are 0 0.3, 0 0.38 uh, GeV, there are theoretical error bars coming from, from matching the, the theory on the Monte Carlos, which are conservatively 0 0.5 GeV, which then widen this up. So also from that point of view, uh, there, there may or may not be a problem, but it's, but it's really not clear given the error bars. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh... Let's, yeah, thank you for stopping sharing. Now, uh, Javier, can you please start sharing? So, ah, um, I'm not. Oh, you I don't have the right yet. Uh, yeah, I can't help you. I think, you know, uh, Sebastian. Yes, you must be able to share now. Okay, very good. So let, let, let me introduce our third and uh, last speaker of this morning session. Uh, this is uh, Javier Rubio, who is going to tell us about scale symmetry, the Higgs, and the nature of gravity. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, first for the invitation, and also to the previous speaker for making a good summary of many of the things I'm, I'm going to say, in particular everything related to Higgs inflation and the nature of gravity. I would like to make uh, a special emphasis on the third concept, that is scale symmetry. It has been appearing every now and then in the different talks, but I would like to emphasize some property of the standard model. In particular, if we take the mass of the Higgs boson to zero in the standard model, the Lagrangian has a larger symmetry. In particular, it is invariant under the simultaneous rescaling of coordinates and fields by a constant with an appropriate uh, scaling dimension D. Uh, so it is similar under the dilatations under the scale symmetry, or if you want in flat spaces under conformal symmetry. 
I mean, this symmetry has appeared in many places in the different talks, sometimes related to the hierarchy problem, also to the value of the, of the running of the Higgs cell coupling. So in particular, when the coupling of the Higgs goes to zero, close to the planet scale, you recover an emergent uh, scale symmetry. And also it plays a central role in everything related to uh, massless scalar fields, to Boltzmann fields, like uh, either inflaton field in Higgs inflation or the darkening field in the cosmos situation that Christopher was discussing. Today, I would like to, to extend this, uh, this symmetry to the concept of to the, to the frame of uh, Higgs inflation. Indeed, if you look at Higgs inflation just in the, you know, the, the basic, the most basic way of writing it, uh, Higgs inflation has an emergent symmetry. You really go to large Higgs field values uh, in the region in which you really inflate, the plant mass is completely negligible, also the Higgs there, and the symmetry is approximately scaling value. It is precisely this scale symmetry which gives rise to the flatness of the Higgs inflation potential when we go to the, to the Einstein frame. Okay? And also is the one responsible for the protection of the flatness of the potential against radiative correction, because essentially in this limit, the Higgs field becomes a Goldstone boson that essentially decouples from other standard model particles. Of course, this symmetry cannot be sad because um, that would mean that the Higgs field is a true Boston boson, and we will never, in this case, finish inflation. We will not reheat the universe because there will not be explicit couplings with, with matter. And also, of course, we will have plenty of problems with uh, electroweak uh, physics. So the symmetry must be broken in, a way, in one way or another. The usual way that we have seen in the previous talks in introducing a, a plant mass uh, close to the, to the non minimal coupling to gravity. But there's also a way in which you can make this breaking, uh, respecting the approximate uh, scale symmetry of, of the theory. Um, indeed, that is what was done long ago in 2009. It was proposed by Saposnik and Daniel Serkhausen, and then it's done in by myself and collaborators. And this has been a recent revival also, rediscovering you one of these models by Ferreira, Hill, and Ross. This is what is essentially called the higgs dilato model. In this uh, scenario, all the dimensionful parameters of the theory, namely the plant mass, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field, and the cosmological constant, are replaced by the expectation value of a dilaton field that will play the role of the Goldstone field. So we'll liberate the, the Higgs field from this responsibility. Um, all the scales in this scenario are induced by a spontaneous breaking mechanism, like the one shown in this, in this formula. In particular, if you take the limit of V equal to zero, there is a, a continuous uh, a, a symmetry, a continuous uh, sorry, ground state um, that is a spontaneous breaking scale symmetry. It is a singlet under the standard model Higgs group. That means that um, you cannot couple it directly to any uh, of the standard model terminals. Possibly you could couple two extensions if you introduce uh, 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 Majorana terminals. Um, and then it's important to notice that in this kind of a scenario, um, the hierarchy of the scales is not a breach. So essentially, these parameters alpha and beta are tuned in order to reproduce the hierarchy of the scale. So in particular, alpha is determining the ratio between the electroweak scale and the plant mass, and beta is determining the value of um, the cosmological constant in Planck and units. So well, this is model has been widely studied in the literature, even we were performing forecasts for future savers, and it's in excellent agreement with observations. Um, also, from the point of view of, uh, of naturalness, it's a rather natural model. In particular, if you set alpha and beta equal to zero, the model displays an additional shift symmetry, um, meaning that the Higgs mass is protected against radiative corrections because all the, all the corrections are proportional to alpha, that is a very small parameter. Of course, this, this uh, shift symmetry is mildly broken by the non minimal coupling of the chi field of the dilaton field to gravity. But when you go to the Einstein frame, you realize that all these uh, corrections are always um, suppressed by the planet scale. Okay. Also, the model does not have any corrections uh, proportional to implants, so that means that there is the graviton of process take massless uh, in a scalar pattern. And finally, since this dilaton field is, uh, is a Goldstone boson, it has only derivative coupling to matter. 
So um, in order to, for this to happen, we will see a bit, this a bit more in detail in what follows. The inclusion of gravity is essential because it makes scale transformations and internal symmetry. Okay. So in some sense, the theory is, is natural in the sense, it's in good agreement with observations. Now, um, we were discussing, of course, all this model was studied originally in the, in the metric formulation, was studied as an extension of fixed inflation. Uh, but we have seen that uh, uh, fixed inflation gives rise to different predictions when um, formulated in different gravity incarnations. Okay? Uh, well, this kind of concepts were introduced, so we go fast. In general, metric and connection are general independent concepts. Metric is something that defines the, the chronogeometry of space time, allows you to measure distances and angles in, in space time, while the connection is really defining, is the quantity that really enters the parallel transport and the geodesic deviation. So, a priori, even although in, in general relativity, these two quantities are, are identified, uh, they, they could be independent. A general connection, in general, includes three pieces. The first one is the so called Levitsky connection, the usual element in general relativity. Then we can also have a deformation tensor that measures the incompatibility of the connection with the metric, and a contortion tensor that measures the antisymmetry of the connection in the two lower indices. Each of the species separately induce uh, curvature, so the change in the, in the direction of the vector when we parallel transport it around a closed path. Non-metricity, the change in the length of the vector when we parallel transport it. And torsion, that is the non-closing of the parallelogram when we parallel, parallel transport two vectors along each other. Okay? So given these three elements, a priori one has, as was emphasized in the previous talk, many different possibilities of constructing a, a theory of gravity. Uh, beyond general relativity, um, we have palatini theories. that are theories um, with, uh, without torsion, but with non-metricity. We have teleparallel theories, that are theories formulated in flat space, but with torsion and non-metricity. And einstein cartan theories, that are theories that are um, metric compatible, but contain torsion. Okay? And of course, all the different intersections that fall into this general category of metric affine gravity. Okay. Well, so as long as, as pure gravity is, or so general relativity is concerned, all these um, formulations are, uh, are equivalent. Uh, but the equivalence is broken once that we include the standard model and couple it to gravity. The, the equivalence is broken in the first place by, by fermions, just because fermions um, can couple to torsion. So in particular, they break the dynasty with einstein cartan theories, for instance. Uh, but these interactions are typically uh, plans press, so it's uh, difficult to, to observe them directly. On the other hand, the coupling to the Higgs field to gravity is a dimension, um, it's a dimension four coupling, same order of the usual einstein hilbert term. So it's not suppressed for by scale. So in that sense, uh, the Higgs field is the perfect proxy to gravity. Um, of course, one you start allowing for all these possible functions um, and start considering more complicated actions constructed in the basis of uh, a metric or a connection, um, well, you can expect that uh, the predictions of, of the model, of the use of, of the Higgs inflation of Higgs local model in this case, are going to change. So one question that is interesting to us is which is... Uh, which are the equivalence classes. So among, among all the theories that I can formulate with metric and, and, uh, and connection, which are those that give rise to uh, roughly the same inflationary observables, the same spectral index and the same terms of the scale ratio. And so this is the question I would like to address today, uh, discussing what I believe is, is a good rule of thumb for um, you know, for classifying this, uh, this kind of uh, non minimally coupled theories. To do that, I'm going to start, or I'm going to discuss an exemplary Einstein Captain Gravity scenario that was already introduced in the previous talk. Um, it complements the Einstein, the Higgs Dalton action I was showing at the beginning of the talk with two extra terms. The first one is the Hall's term that includes a non minimal coupling. Uh, a coupling of the uh, Ricci tensor to the totally anti-symmetric tensor. As well, as was said also in the previous talk, this, this coupling is uh, vanishing in general relativity due to the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. But since Einstein-Cartan, the connection is no longer symmetric in the two lower indices, 
it is possible to do steganomaly center like this with some uh, couplings to the uh, dilaton field and the Higgs field. But you see this action I'm writing it in a way that apparently contains three parameters. Of course, only two of them are independent, okay? This one is the usual, is the usual Barbero in which the parameter, and we have also two couplings to the, of, the of the dilaton and, and the Higgs. But one of them could be always reassorted into the definition of the Higgs. The reason why I'm normalizing this in this way is just to have the same normalization for the dilaton around um, the, the, the moment in which the Higgs field goes to zero. So we can easily compare with uh, the Higgs dilaton, sorry, the Higgs inflation model, the single field case, in which this is uh, given by the plan mass. Okay. On top of that, I had uh, the Nijan uh, term, that is a boundary term in, in general relativity. But uh, now, due to the presence of the nominal couplings, contributes non trivially to the equation of motion. Okay. So if you can parameter, you have a priori uh, six independent parameters. Okay. So now the question is, to which extent these uh, different parameters impact the inflationary observables of the fixed level model? Well, um, in order to, do, to answer this question, it's better to rewrite this einstein cartan theory in a, in a metric uh, formulation. So to do so, what you do is you switch to the Einstein frame in order to get rid of the non-minimal coupling to curvature and recover the usual einstein Hilbert term. And once there, you remove the dependence of torsion by splitting the connection into the torsionless and torsionful part and solving for the torsionful part. And then you plug back the solution into the action. Okay? By doing so, you obtain a metric formulation that contains in the Einstein frame a potential that is as anticipated um, asymptotically flat at large field values. So this region is the one that will allow for inflation. And that contains an infinitely generated vacuum manifold in, uh, well, you know, which uh, opening is given by the by the alpha parameter. Now, of course, all the physics in this infinite degenerate vacuum is independent of the data combined. Now, the price to pay when you move to the Einstein frame is that you modify uh, the kinetic uh, manifold for the Higgs and the dilaton field. This looks rather complicated once you take into account all, all the parameters. As you can see in this figure, in this uh, in this formula, um, this answers partially the question that Arthur was was asking before. When you move to the Einstein frame, um, all the information of the intervention of gravity are replaced by a specific set of higher dimensional operators. So, in some sense, this is different from including directly the terms from the very beginning in the Einstein frame, because if you just in include a higher order operator, there is no effectively theory reason. Not to include others. Okay, so if you want this kind of non-minimal capital to gravity as a selection rule for higher order operators. Okay? An important property of this of this very complicated structure is that if you low look to the large field limit, it is maximally symmetric. So all, all the kinetic manifold is characterized by a constant uh, curvature, a constant Gaussian curvature in this dimensional manifold. This will play a role in the follows. Now, the first thing that you can um, worry about from a periodical point of view is that you have now inflation with two fields. When you have inflation with two fields, um, the usual way of treating this is introducing some projector operators that are parallel and perpendicular to the inflationary trajectory. And then you project the perturbations into these, uh, into these operators, what are usually called the curvature perturbation and isocurvature perturbations. Okay? And it turns out that when you compute the evolution of the curvature perturbation, it is not longer constant at superparison scales, but include another piece that is related to the change of direction of uh, the longitudinal um, component in, in, in field space. So what is usually called the turning rate. Okay? This is typically problematic because it means that the curvature perturbation, perturbation is not conserved outside the horizon, and you can have large superbatu perturbations in, in conflict with observations. So is this something we should worry about? Well, the answer is generically no, because in this model, we have also um, scale symmetry. So scale symmetry is gonna effectively reduce 
the number of degrees of freedom by one, the number of degrees of freedom participating in inflation. How this happens? Well, it's a continuous symmetry, so we can compute which is associated current. And it turns out that this current can be written like the derivative of a scalar, okay? Like the derivative of a kernel, meaning that the conservation equation becomes a clan gordon equation for this scalar quantity. When you look at this scalar quantity, it generally takes the shape of a kind of radial coordinate in the H sky plane. Okay? And trajectories are typically constant in this, when written in terms of this variable. Okay? So phi equal to constant is a trajectory. So this allows us to eliminate in practice one degree of freedom. You can just go to define um, variables in this way some radial variable, some angular, parallel, orthogonal to it, in such a way that the Lagrangian is reduced to this very simple form that depends only on the, on the radial and the angular variable. The radial variable is the Goldstone boson, so it only appears through derivative interactions. Okay? Everything here is completely independent of the slow roll and is completely independent of the shape of the potential, provided, of course, that it respects the scaling variance of the, of the problem. So it can be seen in the other settings. So when you take into account, you, you have reduced the action to this very simple form. And now we can study what happens in the different uh, cases, in particular when you include the whole term and the linear term. Okay. Let me start with the, with the, sorry for the mess, with the form. Okay. I mean, there are many ways in which you can define this uh, angular variable. There's one that I find particularly convenient. That is, I mean, not, not very, not commonly used in the literature, unfortunately. Uh, that is this kind of pole structure uh, that is very similar to what happens, for instance, in alpha tractors. Okay? So when you write um, the kinetic term in Hall's inflation in terms of these variables, you, feel, you find that there is a, a pole that can be quadratic or linear, depending if this parameter C is, um, is equal or different from zero. This parameter C is essentially proportional to the non-minimal coupling of the Dilaton field to gravity. Then you find a Minkowski pole that is only relevant when this theta field goes to one that happens at the bottom of the potential. So it's really a Minkowski pole where the usual the standard model minimally coupled to gravity is recovered. And then uh, you, you get a complicated function, very complicated function of the um, uh, barbaric Nietzsche parameter and the non-minimal coupling uh, of, the, uh, of the Higgs field um, to this term, to the whole term. But the important part is that this function is regular. So whenever you are in the vicinity of the poles, it's going to, be, it's going to turn out to be completely um, irrelevant. Indeed, um, the stretching of the potential, when you go to canonical variables, this potential here will be stretched around, independently of the shape, will be stretched around the position of the pole, getting in canonical variables something that is asymptotically flat. Okay. That is why this, this kind of language is so powerful because it identifies precisely the, the quantity controlling the inflationary observables. Okay. And this quantity turns out to have a, a nice uh, interpretation. This kappa H, that is proportional to non-minimal coupling, is the Gaussian curvature of the kinetic manifold in the large field regime. So essentially the flatness of the potential is controlled by the... Um, by this Gaussian curve. Okay. Notice that this coincides exactly with what happened in the, in the single field model, when the previous talks, they were emphasizing that the flatness of the potential is controlled by psi. That is essentially psi corresponds to the limit of the, of the Gaussian curvature when tau goes to zero. Okay. Well, of course, you can confront this with, uh, you know, make a full scan of uh, the parameter space. That is what we did. Uh, with Matteo Piani that was making all the all this job. Um, well, here, since I can only show three parameters, I'm just using a fiducial value um, of, of tau, 10 to the minus 3, and then scanning all the other four parameters I have in this restricted host scenario. We see that we have always a region in which the predictions of the spectral field and the tensor to scalar ratio coincide with those of a quartic potential that corresponds to the limit of the small non-minimal coupling to gravity. Okay. And then we observe that there is always a region um, of large or minimal coupling in which the tensor to scalar ratio becomes uh, very small and the spectral field is well within uh, the observable, the, you know, the, the CMB constraints. 
So um, essentially, all these predictions are, of course, compatible with um, the single field case, but so also that uh, essentially all the couplings related to uh, the whole term are essentially irrelevant as long as you are uh, close to this atlantic case. We can apply the same kind of, well, maybe just comment on this. Um, so of course, you, you notice that you have also here, when C is different from one, you have also uh, the, the quadratic pole becomes a linear pole. And that gives rise to a modification of large C values that correspond also to tau, large tau values. So essentially, you know, as large field values we are linear. Okay, and this is just a consequence of the quadratic to linear pole structure uh, in the kinetic term. We can apply the same reasoning to needs and inflation. Here, this, the situation is a, bit, um, is a bit more complicated. Still, uh, you can find variables in which you can factor, this should be a capital theta, sorry. Uh, in which you can factorize the kinetic term for the angular variable as a quadratic or linear pole, depending on the value of C. I mean, cozy pole that we will ignore. And there is a new pole that appears that depends on a very complicated combination of all couplings. Okay. Now, the interest of this structure is um, again uh, the poles. So, whenever we are in a region in which the quadratic pole is dominating, we should expect the spectral tilt to lie close to this um, to this prediction. So, essentially, what controls the coefficient in the numerator is the order of the pole. Okay, so the number in the numerator is always controlled by the, by the order of the pole. While the tensor to scalar ratio is controlled both by the order of the pole and the inverse residue of the pole. Okay, in this case, it's controlled at least in order in C by kappa H. Okay. With, if we apply the same to the cubic pole, then we, we expect to find regions in which the spectral tilt approaches this value, where again the coefficient is dictated by um, the order of the pole, that is, in this case it's a cubic pole, and the tensor to scalar ratio is controlled by the residue, in this case controlled by this quantity A, that essentially depends on the difference between tarita and sarita. Again, as we did before, we can compare this with observations, and this is, uh, sorry, with observations, we can perform a parameter scan, and this is what we find. Like before, we find a region of uh, quartic, Heat uh, quartic potential that okay, essentially corresponds to low, small non minimal coupling. We increase, we increase the non minimal coupling, we transition to a metric case in which the server coincides with the usual metric Higgs inflation, and we increase the coupling even more, we transition to um, this palatine region. Um, you know, the main difference with the previous plot is that you find here a new region in which the spectral tilt is slightly higher than the usual Higgs inflation expectation, but the tensor to scalar ratio is still well compatible with, uh, with observations. This new region is precisely associated to the cubic pole I was, I was mentioning before. So here is may, maybe a better visualization. Here is all the, all the points in our, in our parameter scan. And well, you see that there are clearly two, attract, two uh, attractor uh, behaviors. One, the usual one in fixed inflation, and then another one associated to the new field form, okay, as expected. Um, notice that there is a correlation, as I was saying before, to the value of uh, tau eta. So large values of um, tau eta bring us into the new uh, cubic pole attractor. Okay? So when generating this plot, I was um, implicitly assuming a number of e-fold equal to 55, okay? Of course, um, this number of e-folds is expected to be different in different uh, gravity incarnations, just because so the gravity five, incarnation- Five more minutes. Uh, Sorry? Five more minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, just in different gravity incarnations, just because the non-minimal coupling to gravity changes also, changes also the the effective coupling in Einstein frame to the standard model particles, so we also dispute a, a different uh, reheating efficiency. Um, well, we can, you can analyze that in detail. Um, uh, maybe I can skip this. You can analyze that in detail. Uh, we were 
considering, for instance, two limiting cases, the metric light regime and the palatine light regime. Um, in the metric light regime, the potential is roughly quadratic around the minimum, so it oscillates with an equation of the state that is approximately zero. So all the particle production happens to the gates uh, separate. In the palladini light regime, the potential is approximately quartic around the minimum, and the transition to the plateau region is, is very rapid. So when the field finishes inflation, it is able to go back to the plateau region once and once again, exploring the transition that is a tachyonic region. So in palatini light regime, you should expect, and indeed this is what we analyzed together with Emily Tomberg, and then was also confirmed using uh, numerical lattice simulations by Andre, Inar, and collaborators. Um, so essentially, well, you go back to the plateau. In average, you have an equation of the state that is still minus one, so you are still inflating in average, but still but producing particles uh, exponentially. So this, uh, the detailed analysis of this tra translates into a different efficiency of the different states, and therefore a different number of defaults to be included uh, to be included in this in this expression. Okay. So even although formally the expression is the same in metric and palatine case, because in both cases you're dominated by a quadratic pole, the number of things to be included is, uh, is different. And that is what is somehow summarized in this uh, plot here, when I saw the tensor to scalar ratio as a function of the spectral field for different models. And as you can see, uh, metric and palatine Higgs inflation are a priori distinguishable of two sigma by future CMB polarization experiments like CMB stage four. Meaning that, okay, at least there is some hope of distinguishing gravity inc incarnations by looking at the spectral field and not only to the tensor to scalar ratio, that is the usual quantity that is very different between incarnations. And just very quickly, just to, to put the, a bit of context, of course, this is the action I was considering is not the only thing that you can construct with, um, with a connection and, and the metric. Um, this, uh, the general framework for constructing this theory was formulated by, well, essentially by the workshop organizers and uh, Giorgio, Giorgio Caranas. Um, in order to have a healthy extension, you, there are some few requirements that seems like rather natural. The gravitational operators should uh, be of mass dimension not larger than, than two. So that means that essentially we are forbidding R squared terms or similar like that, things like that, of course. Uh, more than quadratic in the connection, so we are not including additional degrees of freedom. The matter Lagrangian, well, in the flat state limit, should be better renormalizable in such a way that the gravity incarnations are the only ones generating higher dimensional operators. At least you have, you have some kind of control from the beginning. Um, no mixing terms should be included just because uh, we want to recover the Higgs field at low energies. And, well, it's somehow com following the, the previous rule, the gravity matter interactions uh, uh, should be of the order of uh, smaller or equal to four. Of course, all these conditions can be dropped, but at least provide a framework in which uh, formulate healthy theories. And uh, well, the general action that you see here is much more complicated. In general, it includes um, uh, terms associated to the different irreducible representations of the connection and coefficients or functions that are functions of the ratio of h over chi and following from, um, the, um, from the first two requirements should be quadratic in the, in the ratio of the fields. Um, restricting this uh, is complicated. You have a lot of freedom, but a priori you, can, you could impose uh, some theoretical requirements like actions of the of tactions that would restrict partially the parameter space and also maybe requiring some uh, features that are interesting like uh, you know, raising the cutoff, like happens in Palatine Higgs inflation. And from a earlier point of view, you can put also restrictions, uh, like comparing with inflationary predictions, but also uh, looking at the dilaton production that due to this term can be different in different gravity incarnations. In any case, what is clear is that whatever model of this kind you construct, there will be some features that are interesting and just related to scale invariance. So even although you had always two fields, you can always reduce the problem to single field dynamics. There will not be isocurvature perturbations. There will be no non-nausianities. No, no, no and since the coupling of the dilaton is only happening through the negative interactions, there will be no fifth force effects. Okay? So this is uh, finally everything I wanted to say. So essentially, uh, well, I was just arguing that different gravity formulations become equivalent. 
when you couple the matter sector, the standard model to the connection. Um, that also in this kind of scenarios, you find a tensor cross killer ratio that is highly suppressed in palatine scenarios compared to the metric case. In some scenarios, you can even find new attractor behaviors. That is something interesting to explore that is absent in the single field regime. And then I was emphasizing that is emphasizing that it's important to, to pay attention to the preheating dynamics because that can translate or allow you to differentiate also these scenarios when looking at the spectral field. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. So please, uh, I think uh, Laura raised her hand first. Please unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. I have a couple of questions about um, the model that you're using. So first question is, can you please uh, repeat again where the dilaton comes from? What is your reason to introduce uh, that uh, and the second question is uh, when you have uh, the current um, that is conserved, uh, which allows you, if I understood well, to you know have an evolution along those colored lines that you were you were showing, and then from there you, you decompose into phi and theta uh, directions. Mm -hmm. Where that comes from as well. Thanks. Okay. okay. So, um, so I'm introducing here the, the dilaton because um, I want to impose or to, uh, to promote its inflation to a scaling variant framework. Okay? The simplest way of doing that would be simply to remove all scales from the theory, but in that case, you will get an action like this one. So the Higgs field will be the Goldstone boson of the scale symmetry. Uh, so that automatic will not be viable because you will not have, uh, well, as you can see when you go to the Einstein frame, uh, a Higgs mechanism active. And also it will be problematic for having inflation because you will have essentially a cosmological constant. Um, you will never finish inflation. And we will never be able to reheat in any way because essentially the Higgs is, is will be completely decoupled from, from math. So in order to um, incorporate the scaling variance, you have to go for uh, another field. And the way of doing this, uh, introducing a field in which uh, that is responsible for spontaneous symmetry breaking of the scaling variance. So in this setting, this new field will play the role of uh, the Goldstone field that cannot be played by the Higgs. Now, of course, you can argue that, uh, well, I'm introducing this field by hand, uh, but uh, we were working also on embeddings of this uh, scenario in, into a bigger setting. So you can uh, really formulate these kind of theories in, instead of formulating them in general relativity, you can formulate in transverse diffeomorphisms. So that is the minimal uh, group that uh, you need in order to have a spin to field, in order to have a gravity, okay? Usually people don't go to these theories because you have to pay a price. Uh, these theories introduce a new field, uh, a new, a scalar degree of freedom, okay? Uh, and usually this degree of freedom is key. You know, the, the, the two limiting cases of these transverse diffeomorphisms theories is, uh, is general relativity, in which you kill this degree of freedom by choosing some specific transfer combinations. And unimodular gravity, you kill this degree of freedom by essentially freezing the dilatation mode. So you fix the, uh, a condition in which you restrict the metric determinant to one, and essentially it's volume preserving diffeomorphisms. Um, so, well, so there's a way in which you can, you know, if you forget about general relativity, you can also introduce this, this field for pure gravitational interactions, and it can play the role of, of the ghost. And then at a more phenomenal level, um, also you want, but that is a, a separate issue. In this kind of scenarios, also this field um, can play the role of dark energy in the late universe. And for that, it's, it's also interesting that it is a ghost field. And now regarding your second question, let me see if I remember. Um, so essentially the, the point is when you formulate this theory in terms of H and K, everything looks very complicated. Uh, they are mixing terms and, uh, and apparently looks like a two-field model. But what I was trying to emphasize is that it is a continuous symmetry. So you can always uh, compute the current associated to scaling value, okay? Like the net current associated to scaling value. 
And it turns out that this current can be generically written like the derivatives of the scalar quantity. Okay? So like normal derivatives of the scalar quantity is called time. So when you look at this conservation current, you realize that, okay, essentially it looks like the klein norman equation for this variable phi. Okay? Now you think about this in an expanding universe, you open this box, this is essentially uh, phi double dot plus three h phi dot. Uh, so essentially, independently of which is the value of phi that you start, you could start um, you know, uh, with very random initial conditions in this point. This equation acts like an attractor. So independent of the initial conditions, you're gonna be driven to one of these circular trajectories. Okay? So this somehow defines some kind of privileged variables in which formulate the problem. Okay? In particular, in these variables, uh, you trivialize the evolution of phi, phi is constant. And then all the dynamics is, trans is, trans is translated to the, to the value of theta. Thanks, that was very clear. Sorry? More questions. Uh, anybody else? Uh, we still have three minutes. Sebastian? Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. So I'm wondering about your statement in the end that um, Palatini and metric Higgs inflation can be distinguished using the reheating dynamics, so the different uh, number of E-foldings in particular. Um, now, in the metric scenario, do we really know preheating, or does it depend on the UV completion? That depends on the UV completion. That is a good question. I mean, uh, still, there is an uncertainty of the number of equals. What you know for sure is that it's instantaneous, okay? Or it's, 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 well, instantaneous. It's roughly instantaneous. But of course, you should expect a difference between those scenarios just because in, in one you are tightly in matter combination, in the other one you are in. in in variation nomination because it's much more efficient this type of Of course, there is an uncertainty on the on the metric, uh, essentially related to the fact that you generate uh, particles with momenta that can be larger than the cathode of the field. And so, so in the beginning, did you say it's instantaneous in metric, or like uh, how do the statements no, go? No, to instantaneous. It's instantaneous if you assume. Okay, if you if you compute it. You know, in the original way we were computing this, this is, is, is fast, but it's not instantaneous. Okay? It takes around 100 oscillations of the field to really review. Now, of course, if you go and you compute in, uh, in the, you know, taking into account these spike instabilities for the longitudinal gauge bosons, you obtain something that is much more energetic. Okay? And that is almost instantaneous. Now, the question is, should you trust that computation from, from the very beginning? I don't think so because you are already computing in a regime in which the theory is not valid. So before claiming anything about the reheating, you should for sure include higher dimensional operators that are covering uh, the fact that you're going on top of the cathode. Till the moment I see that analysis, I, I'm skeptical about that thing because in all the models in which this somehow you are, every, the dynamic is regularized, like for instance, in the scalar on, if you include a scalar on things like that, or in Palatina is also performing some kind of regularization of this spike. This mechanism is never so efficient as, as claimed in, in, in those papers of the spike instability. So I'm a, a bit skeptical uh, till the moment in which this computation is performed, including higher order operators. All right, but so in these UV completions like the scalar on, um, the preheating is still approximately instantaneous or like no. less than one in, the scalar, in the scalar case, the dynamic is more complicated and depends on which regime you are. But essentially, uh, it's, it's closer to the old treatment of preheating in metric Higgs inflation than to these spikes. All right. But maybe Anna, Anna is in the audience. I think she was doing that. So maybe uh, I'm not sure she was. Uh, maybe she can comment on that, but essentially all this spike feature disappears when when you are in a setting in which the momentum that produce particles are below the cathode. All right, thank you. Okay, so I I don't see any further questions, and the time is up. So uh, uh, let me thank all three speakers and the audience for another very nice uh, discussion once again. And I understand that the organizers will leave the room open and the breaking the breakout rooms are open. So maybe uh, yeah, if the speakers want so, they can each choose one breakout room. Uh, and of course, the audience can see and follow them there to have more discussion. Or we can just stay here and discuss. I mean, everybody. Uh,
feel free what to do. I maybe I should announce when we continue. I mean, the organizers should announce. I think uh, according to my schedule, we continue at two o'clock, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, right. Or yeah. Okay. So how shall we proceed? Shall we join the discussion room? So if there are some questions. Maybe maybe if there are questions in general about that, we can we can discuss here in the common room. Uh, and, I, I have a general question, maybe. I don't know how general it is. So to me, uh, I mean, I'm uh, an old-fashioned person used to the now unfashionable concept of, fine of, of naturalness and fine-tuning. So to me, it seems that, I mean, this is probably probably accepted that this is fine-tuned, right? I mean, the Higgs inflation, if I put myself at the top of the potential where it's very flat, and I ask what are the loop correction to the potential of the Higgs at that point, I probably don't get a good answer. I mean, it is not flat in a natural way. Is that right? It's not right. I'm, no, it's Sorry? not right. Depends. It's not right. No. Then you have to explain to me why it's flat. Yeah, because uh, there are symmetries, shift symmetry, which protects uh, you from any type of radiative correction. Oh, there is no shift symmetry. Sorry, in my in my world, there's no shift symmetry. I mean, you don't need, for that you need to regularize. You need to regularize a series such that you have a shift symmetry, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you have uh, if you have uh, free free uh, free scale of field which doesn't interact with anything, uh, which has uh, then there is shift symmetry there. Okay. So take uh, Einstein I, I frame. Yes. Okay, take thanks. Einstein frame. Take Einstein frame and uh, consider uh, the interactions of the Higgs field at large values of the Higgs field and Einstein frame. Then this is a free uh, free field with uh, the action d mu chi square. There is nothing else. And so there is shift symmetry, and this shift symmetry protects you from radial correction. But there is a quad, there is a, uh, so you say the potential is completely flat at that point. Right? Absolutely flat. Yeah. 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 And then and, there is no and, coupling. And, and the, what about what about the electron? It's too heavy. No, 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 no. Electron, electron doesn't couple to, to this field. I thought you were talking about the Higgs field. I am confused. But in the sense I say thing, in the in the last field regime, the Higgs, you have a scale symmetry, so the Higgs field becomes a Boltzmann, so there is no coupling. There is no coupling. So electron is massive. It has a mass proportional to the Planck scale times uh, Yukawa coupling divided by psi, but uh, the Higgs field doesn't couple to anything whatsoever. How can you? How have you switched off, off all the couplings? I don't understand that. Uh, you take this theory. You go to Einstein frame. You take the limit when Higgs field goes to infinity, and you find that this is free scalar field. But what, okay, good. So, so I, that I accept. So, it, so you go, so you have a potential which at zero is a usual Higgs potential. And at very large Higgs fields, it's completely flat and it couples to nothing. Yes. So these regimes are natural. Yes. Uh, but I somehow have doubts in the transition regime uh, where you, where the Higgs potential becomes, turns over and be, it goes over the exponential. I mean, there you have to have a, lot, a huge conspiracy of stuff happening for, for this to be natural. I mean, the two, the two extrema, I agree, but, but uh, have you, can you check naturalness in the transition regime where the potential yeah. becomes more and more flat? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I can only yeah, accept. No, okay. Uh, I, I can okay. give you... Uh, I have a related... Several... Yeah, there are several references. Uh, there is a paper which uh, Javier uh, and uh, collaborators had, and there is a paper which uh, uh, Sergei Sibirikov uh, and uh, collaborators had, etc. So there is a whole bunch of literature which is devoted precisely to the question you asked. I can send you the references. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I have a related question. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yes, you can speak. Yeah. You hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is that. Uh, okay. Yesterday we have seen uh, all the problems for the uh, quant quantization of uh, of uh, gravity itself. Uh, no, uh, the by adding uh, by adding a, a sort of um, non-conventional um, 
interaction between Higgs and gravity, uh, you, uh, as you as you mentioned, and and, and all the, the all the speakers mentioned, uh, the in Einstein frame, uh, the for instance, kinetic term is not at all conventional. Then I ask myself, what what would be the impact on the renormalization of uh, of even uh, even uh, standard model? Hello. Is it, is a question for me, for instance, or I, I don't mind uh, answering. I mean, you have gravity, and gravity is not a normal. My my question is is uh, from all the speakers of this morning because you have all uh, considered uh, more or less the same type of uh, uh, of uh, Higgs inflation. Yes. So uh, renormalizability is lost to start with. The moment you take standard model and gravity together, there is no renormalizability, for instance. I mean, gravity is a non-renormalizable theory. Okay, even, even if you, uh, you don't consider, um, uh, I mean, gravity as a, as a quantized, uh, just uh, consider it yeah, like, yeah. In, uh, like in normal, uh, normal field theory, we don't consider it as, as um, we consider it as classical field. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but still, it's a non-renormalizable theory. It's an effective theory, right? Huh? Yes, therefore, therefore, this is a prop. This, this is this problematic because because if uh, uh, just by addition of a, a few terms, uh, the the model com uh, becomes completely uh, non-renormalizable, then then no, we have a problem. It's not. A, I mean, gravity is non-renormalizable to start with, irrespective of what we're doing with uh, the standard but, model, coupling it non-minimally or not. Yeah, but um, but <laughs> as I said, uh, let's. Take the simple assumptions that um, uh, inflation uh, inflation scale is much uh, lower than uh, quantum gravity scale, and we can consider gravity as as classical. Then we have a model with uh, non-conventional uh, kinetics and uh, kinematics and uh, and also. Uh, other yeah. uh, type of no, but, uh, additional but... uh, additional interaction terms, uh, which can uh, which can make completely the model non renormalizable This is my question. Sure, but w w w uh, yeah, but again, irrespective of the non canonical kinetic term or so, non renormalizability is there because gravity is a non renormalizable theory. So the only thing that I'm doing by coupling it. Uh, by, by allowing for the Higgs to interact non-minimally with the scalar curvature, because probably that's your objection. Why do that? We do that because this uh, is a, yes. modifica a kinetic mixing between graviton and Higgs. This kinetic mixing between graviton and Higgs, written in different variables, translates in non-canonical kinetic term for the Higgs. Now, yet another field redefinition that we can always do because it's a single field, it's a function of one variable, so we can even go further with a redefinition and move the non-linearities, this uh, how to say non-conventional kinetic term, to a non-conventional potential. Now, in the limit that you are interested for inflation, the field values are such that this non-conventional kinetic term, a non-conventional uh, coupling to curvature, translates into a potential which is approximately flat, exponentially close to flat. And this is what allows you to have really nice predictions. So it's not a problem, it's a, how say, it's a virtue of this non-minimal coupling. I wouldn't call it a problem. The problem sorry, comes... Sorry, sorry I'm, still, sorry, I'm still very confused. I mean, we just discussed uh, about the metastability situation. So I do a calculation. This is something which even a naive person like I can do. The Higgs uh, potential goes up and then it turns over. And uh, if, the Higgs, if the top mass is large enough, it turns over and goes negative. And at the same time, you do calculation where it goes up and then approaches exponential flatness. Now, these are two possible theories. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them relies on a, on, a, on a large set of high dimension operators becoming relevant. How can both be natural? I, I just don't understand. To me, it's clearly necessary to have some, call it conspiracy, call it adjustment, call it symmetry reason, that the high dimension operators have to be right for the potential not to turn over and go negative, but instead to approach very precisely, uh, oh. a horizontal line. Okay. Uh, okay. Javier, I, I would like to hear you. 
say that oh, yeah. I'm, stupid. I'm stupid and it's totally wrong what I'm saying. I mean, it's so basic field theory. Um, so, you know, the approach here is, is, is slightly different. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's, I want to, to develop this a bit more. But essentially, the approach we usually follow is, is bottom up. So we start with uh, a, standard, a standard model of minimal capital gravity and include all possible operators that are generated by the theory. Okay? So since these operators are generated by the theory, these operators by construction respect all the asymptotic symmetry of the theories. As you say, in the middle, things, different things can happen. You know? In particular, you had always, um, you can always adjust the coefficient of these Wilson operators to something that allows you to restore, for instance, back instability, as you were saying. But there's still the asymptotic properties of the theory are maintained. No, no, that I agree. But if I'm an yeah. Einstein frame person starting from zero and running up the potential, running up an energy and hence running up the potential, then we, we all agree there are two options. The potential can turn over. I mean, the metastability stability stuff is not wrong. And it can no. become very flat. So but the Higgs stuff no, is also no, 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 Arthur. Uh, let's take uh, uh, your case which you want to consider in which uh, you have large top mass. Okay. Yes, and then, uh, Just yeah, an example. Then, yeah. yeah, the potential then will go up, then it will go down, and then it will again lead to the plateau. But uh, this plateau uh, may be negative. Okay. So in any event, uh, the potential is uh, flat at large uh, field values. And this happens absolutely naturally. This is uh, the result of non minimal yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, you, but you just said you, just, you, you said you can have fixed inflation even at large top mass. So are you, are you now saying that you cannot have fixed inflation at large enough top mass? No, no. Uh, let me continue. Okay, so if uh, uh, you are uh, blindly uh, looking at this potential and not analyzing the question where the uh, change of the running of the couplings is happening, then uh, you can have uh, uh, the picture in which potential goes up and then uh, you have a plateau or you have a picture in which potential goes up, then it goes down and then it has a plateau at the negative values, okay? There is uh, yet a third possibility. And in, in the second case, Higgs inflation is not possible, period. Okay, because the potential, then you have a barrier and this barrier cannot be overcome by the Higgs field, okay? There is a third possibility, which is uh, still within uh, the, the picture. And that's exactly the possibility which we considered with uh, Javier and other collaborators, uh, which goes like this. So potential goes up, then it goes down, it gets negative. Uh, after it ne gets negative, it goes up again, and then you have a plot. And if you have this type of uh, potential, then again, Higgs inflation becomes possible, okay? And uh, if you have uh, top mass Higgs uh, large enough, then uh, the distinction between second and third possibility is associated with UV completion of the theory, which is not at our hands. And it can be this way or other ways we don't know. But uh, in any event, uh, the potential is flat at large values of the Higgs field. Yeah, yeah. At large values, I, I, I'm happy because they, because then it's clear mm -hmm. that if, if once you switch off all the couplings, flatness is natural. I just, uh, I mean, from the logic of the different models that have been discussed, it seems to be necessary to make some choices to go from when they go from standard model to the flatness. It seems to, and these choices to me. No, but but flatness of the, yeah, no, 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 but flatness of, is aftermarket. Uh, so there flatness is no theory in field. And, but this flatness can be well, positive, it can be negative. And, yeah, and yeah, that, that, is, uh, that, 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 that is not, not the flatness, uh, uh, which, go, okay, I think I agree. I, I, I understand. I, I, of course, if you, if, you, if, you, if you define the symptotic theory right, you will have flatness, but the transition there requires a proper choice of certain operator coefficients of a large yes, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. You know, I, am I relieved as a as a chair, as a session chair? I mean, I I think so. I, yeah, thank I, you, I, I, thank I, you very I'm, much. Thank I'm you very much. Uh, I, I need to go. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but by the way, just just one question. So uh, I was streaming so far uh, on YouTube. 
Uh, if you if you do not want uh, this discussion session to be recorded, I can delete that. Uh, I prefer it because, not to be recorded. They probably said stupid things. No, I, 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 I think that's perfectly. Per per the reaction from Vakusha, I, 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 no, no. I was asking no, things no, no. Uh, which are obvious. So that's no, why no, no, they are not at all. They are not at all obvious. I, I think it's of the value to community to 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 hear this discussion. That's why if I decided. You, if, if you want, I'm happy to be stupid on on YouTube. That's fine. You, you, <laughs> you, you can watch my whole mechanics lectures one and two on YouTube. There, can, there are plenty of places you can see where I'm stupid. <laughs> no, it's not, not at all about being stupid, but just this. Uh, maybe some other, some other participants also uh, yeah. also can. Yeah, you can see all the is... my, my, my QFT one course on you and YouTube. That would be even more embarrassing because it's in English. <laughs> Everybody can see what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thank thanks you. a lot. Sorry, Bye. 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 Yeah, yeah. Bye. Yeah, yeah. So, so leave it if you wish. <laughs> bye bye.